welcome to this week's edition of Scots in Us and a very special journey that we're going to be taking today with John Harbour of Exclusive Scottish Visits. John, you're going to be taking us on a very special tour that we're very grateful to you for organising and arranging. Um, and we're going to be going, first of all, to Schoon Palace and you're speaking with Viscount Stormont. And we're going to journey up Moot Hill with you, I believe, first of all, before we go to the palace. And then across to Edinburgh Castle. And then across to seeing where the Stone of Destiny now is living over Perth Museum, which is a new museum, which is very exciting. It, it is indeed. And uh, having been there for the first time, it was very exciting. Um, just to put things in context, I, I'm actually taking you back to the 8th century, the first King of Scots, Kenneth MacAlpine, who brought the Stone of Destiny over from Dalriada in the West Coast to what then was the Ecclesiastical Centre of Scotland, and that was Schoon, near Perth. Um, if we fast forward to the 12th to 16th century, we have a beautiful abbey that's built. Of course, an abbey is um, a bishop's palace, effectively, where the word palace comes from. The Murray family took it in about 1600, the palace, which was destroyed by the reformers, sadly. And then in the 1800s, they build this fabulous palace. And that's really where the story begins, at Schoon Palace. Well, thank you so much. And so shall we begin our journey? Over to we you. Should. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So as we look at Schoon Palace, Moot Hill is right next to it. And as we come up these stairs, you can see ahead of us, the wonderful mausoleum, the Mansfield Mausoleum, and also the private family chapel. I'm sitting right on top of Moot Hill, but this is where the Stone of Destiny itself would have sat. And one thing that I want to show you, Robert the Bruce was crowned here in 1306. Well, here I am, right on top of Moot Hill at Schoon Palace, next to the place where kings were crowned on this site. And this is where the Stone of Destiny used to be. Beside me is actually a replica of the Stone of Destiny. But I'm going to tell you about the real stone's journey from here all the way to the south and back to Scotland. And so to the Stone of Destiny. As I said, this is a replica, but sitting here was the real Stone of Destiny. Until in 1296, Edward I, Hammer of the Scots, came north due to a difference of opinion when it came to who actually was to be King of Scotland. Another story for another day. But the King Edward defeated the Scots at the Battle of Dunbar and after the battle was over he decided to take his spoils of war, one of which was the real Stone of Destiny. And he took it from this place all the way down to Westminster, thinking and believing that when he had that particular piece of Scottish regalia then Scottish kings could no longer be crowned. Of course he was wrong, but that stone went to Westminster and stayed there for 700 years. Schoon Abbey was hugely important because it was right next to the area where kings were crowned. Um, we're up on Moot Hill, slightly raised ground. There would have been a dry ditch all the way around here. And this was not a defensive position. This was a hugely significant sanctum where the kings of Scotland gave their vows to the people of Scotland. So let me take you on the Stone of Destiny's journey from 1296, when King Edward I took the stone all the way to the south, until 700 years later, in 1996, when it was returned to Scotland. It's been quite a journey. And now, of course, it's sitting only two miles from here in Perth Museum. Before we start, though, I'm delighted to say that the Viscount Stormont has agreed to give us his perspective, to give us the history of the place and tell us what he feels about the Stone of Destiny returning to the place where it originated. So let's go and see Viscount Stormont. Well, I'm delighted to say that I'm with the Viscount Stormont in the fabulous Schoon Palace. And thank you, Viscount Stormont, for inviting us here today uh, to talk about this wonderful place and also tell us a little bit about the Stone of Destiny. Before we get started, could you just tell us how should we pronounce, is it Schoon or Scone? Um, scone, Schoon or Scone. Oh, confusing. Um, this is Schoon Palace. Right. Yeah. And uh, before we, we actually talk about the stone, um, I'd like to maybe take you back to when you were a child. When did you first realise that the responsibility for this place was yours and, and how did you face the enormity of that challenge? Um, it's a good question. There, I've thought about this myself. That there wasn't a sort of 
a Lion King moment, you know, sort of, you know, son, this is your kingdom, you know, da, da, da. Mm. That, there wasn't that, it was sort of more like a sort of a dawning realization over many and many years. Um, but I had a, I had sort of a strange one in lockdown, actually, when uh, I actually lived in the palace full time for the first time, because previously my grandparents had been here. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the beginning of COVID, we fled London, we being me and my then girlfriend. Um, and we were actually in the Balbaird wing, mm -hmm. um, which is the, the letable apartments. Yeah. Um, and we were walking around. Obviously, the place was entirely empty. There was no one here. It was locked down. Um, and I was walking past the front door. And I suddenly was hit with this sort of realization that this is all my responsibility and mm -hmm. it's all on me. But also, like, life is really weird. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's in terms of I could, it could be anyone else. It could be anywhere else in the world. Um, but I am me, which means <laughs> this is my family's and my responsibility, and I get to be here, live here, work here. Um, it's just, it's a strange old world. Yes, and of course, when you walk around the palace and you look at these fabulous paintings, you're connected in some way with most of them. Yeah, well, yeah, all of them. Uh, they're either members of the family or a portrait or a picture, a landscape, which someone in the family previously mm. uh, took a liking to and so, and so purchased. So mm. they're, they're, all, they're all part of our history in some way or other. Mm -hmm. I'm right in thinking you went to Oxford to do an MBA yes. um, in business, as it happens. Probably yes. the first, I believe, in 400 years? Um, yes. Um, so the first to be educated in business. Um, not the first to be educated. The family's <laughs> extremely well edu educated for a very long time. Mm -hmm. But no one has been educated in business until myself, which, mm -hmm. is, which is interesting because we've essentially been a family of business for 400 years, although yeah. we wouldn't have called ourselves that. Yes. Um, we were essentially generations of incredibly gifted and highly educated people mm -hmm. but who weren't necessarily business people. Yeah. But uh, we're now very much business people. And the tools that you gained from Oxford, first of all, were they useful? How do you use them and how do you keep yeah. a palace like this alive in the 21st century? They were extremely useful. Um, I gained a few other things as well, uh, like a, a wife. That was, uh -huh. very, that, was yes. very, that was a good, big bonus takeaway. Yep. Um, a lot of actually very good friends. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually the network that you build at business school is, is a big part of, of why you, you go. The key skills there and the breadth of skills is extremely useful. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there isn't any aspect of business that I look at now with trepidation. It's all something that I know and understand, yep. um, uh, if not enjoy. Um, so yeah, it's been incredibly useful, yes. especially because we, we actually I was talking to one of our um, advisors recently who advises a lot of people um, in our kind of world, and he described us as the most diverse and complex business mm -hmm. that he's seen. Mm -hmm. um, so we have you know, farming, forestry, tourism, whatever else it is, all uh, interlapping, all cyclical, all seasonal. Um, so it, it is quite a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. So a, a business education is vital in many yes, ways. Yes, and you diversified, including having private apartments in the, in the palace. Yeah. yeah, and then obviously events in the grounds as well, and now Perth Racecourse and the lodge, the hotel that's attached to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're increasingly diversified yeah. and therefore increasingly busy. So certainly if you are watching this, ASF members, and you're coming to Scotland, think about coming to Schoon Palace. A lovely place to stay, as I can guarantee I've seen it. Um, <laughs> You mentioned uh, a certain lady that you met at Oxford University, yes. Charlotte Clune, now Lady Charlotte. In Charlotte, yeah. Uh, who became your wife. What was her first, when she first walked the door, what must she have thought when she saw this amazing place? Um, I know exactly what she thought, um, <laughs> which was like, flip, what am I getting into? Um, but I also, I didn't, I didn't play the game very well. It was a bit unfair on poor Charlotte because um, I didn't tell her much. Oh. Um, and she knew vaguely because I, I'd been in a Mary Berry mm -hmm television show which yes. was aired when we were at yes. Oxford mm -hmm. so a lot of people I kept myself to myself but a lot of people then found out my cover was blown <laughs> um, and so she didn't see the program but she heard the sort of mm -hmm. rumors circulating about about sort of this weird Scottish guy on the course um, so then I invited her up here and um, my parents were having a, a weekend um, party and I thought it's a good opportunity to get her up and show her the place um, which meant that she met my my parents at a black tie event, a lot of their friends, including the head of uh, Clan McGregor and the head of the uh, Dundonald, Lord, Lord, uh, Lord Dundonald, uh, and many others, all in one, whilst we had a Halloween event going on in the garden. So then I was half an hour later um, being interviewed by STV live in the gardens whilst there were zombies running around in the background. <laughs> so she was extremely confused by this, this, this person and his life. Um, 
uh, and obviously the the scale of the history yeah. here yeah. has and it's taken her a while to take it on board but she's a very uh, gifted individual so mm -hmm. uh, I'm extremely lucky fantastic and I believe there's a new addition to the yes. generations yes there is um, and that's the the American connection as well so yeah. obviously Charlotte was uh, from Connecticut from West Hartford um, and my little boy is called Helia um, is half American so uh, yeah, fantastic. That's wonderful, especially yeah. for American Scottish Foundation as well. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <clears throat> Can I just now talk a little bit about history? Now, we know that uh, Chaldees were here in around 700. Yeah. Kenneth MacAlpine, of course, uh, the first king of Scots in about 840, thereabouts. Yeah. And then, of course, the great um, abbey uh, yeah. that was here. Um, can you just give me your perspective on how uh, history developed here and the Murray family part in it. Yeah, um, cranky. Um, I will write a book on this at some point, <laughs> but um, to, to, to do it briefly, Schoon uh, historically represents several things. As you said, it was a site for the Culdees, mm -hmm. it was a Christian site for, for basically the duration up until my family arrived here in 1600. Um, so alongside the coronations that happened here, alongside the parliaments that happened here, there was always a religious establishment here of mm -hmm. some shape or form. And obviously it grew over time to become the abbey, which lent its name to the palace. Mm -hmm. And because where the, where the abbot lives, he lives in the abbot's palace, yeah. hence why it was Schoon, Schoon Palace. Um, so that was what was going on in the background, but it was referred to um, as, a, as a place more than just as a religious institution by the likes of Malcolm Canmore and David the mm First. -hmm. Um, Malcolm Canmore described it as the principal seat of his realm mm -hmm. uh, and the royal city of Schoon, in terms of there was a village around the abbey, yeah. as there quite typically is. Yeah. And that obviously all declined throughout the, uh, the 15th and 16th centuries, and then was, uh, that was really sort of triggered further by the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And that's when my family came into the picture yeah. in about 1600. Um, after, after a rather murky event in, in Perth. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like to, to spin it with, uh, it was due to our, our very loyal service to the Stuart monarchs. Of course, I have to say I, I learned about the Gowrie conspiracy um, in my history books, and, and I'm, I'm intrigued to see your take, hear your take on it, but we yeah. haven't got time for that today, unfortunately, <laughs> but perhaps another time. Um, when you're standing at your kitchen sink at the back of the house and maybe just rinsing some dishes and you look mm -hmm. across and you can see Moot Hill with the, okay, it's the replica now, but the Stone of Destiny sitting up there. How do you feel about that connection with the Stone of Destiny and, and Scotland's history in general? Um, it, it fills me with great pride mm -hmm. and also a huge um, sense of responsibility. It's kind of helpful in a way because my family's story is, is very interesting and there were some great figures there, but the history of Schoon is, is weighted much more towards that medieval history. Mm -hmm. That's what's truly significant and truly special about coming here. That's um, humbling in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it fills me with great pride because of the place that Schoon holds in the hearts and minds of, of Scots. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's mm -hmm. our duty as a family to kind of to uphold that and to educate whoever wants to be educated about that. Yes. Um, and that, that fills me, the, the sort of that journey fills me, that sort of our, our obligation to, to people it fills me with great joy yeah. in ways. You must have watched with interest in 1996 when the yeah. Stone of Destiny was brought across the border flanked by Scottish soldiers and taken to Edinburgh Castle. Mm -hmm. And of course now uh, it's coming to Perth. Yeah. Um, how do you feel that just two miles from here, across the River Tay, you've got this stone back that's, that's given so much history to Scotland and was part of this house? Um, it's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic because it was, as you said, in Edinburgh, but it, it wasn't particularly well displayed mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. Edinburgh. And, and also it's quite out of context there. Yeah. Whereas across the way in Perth, it is much, much closer to its original home yes. and much better presented. Yes. Um, I got to know the interpretation team at Perth Museum very well and they've done a fantastic job. Yeah. Um, yeah, if we couldn't have it here, it's, uh, it's great to have it there. Indeed. In yeah. fact, just this morning, uh, we'll be heading off to see great. Perth Museum and see the stone, <coughs> and we believe you actually get a mention as well. As I do, I do get a little mention. Yeah, as a, I was part of the committee that were, had, our job was to discuss how the stone, which really is a sort of a religi religious relic, mm -hmm. how that should be presented in a, in a, a, a way that was fitting for it, given its status, yeah. uh, which was, uh, it was a strange experience because I was in a room with Scotland's greatest historians, greatest living historians, and then there was little old me, and I felt rather <laughs> out of place, but um, uh, it, was, uh, it was great to be in the room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, um, thank you very much indeed. This has been really enlightening. Very much appreciate you taking the time out to speak to our American Scottish Foundation team. Uh, my and, pleasure. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Well, we've come all the way down from Schoon Palace and also Moot Hill, where the Stone of Destiny was resting. You've got to use your imagination now. King Edward I's army has come all the way down to the English border and he's got about 10,000 men with him. You've got to imagine the cavalry, the infantry, the archers, and right in the middle of this throng is the spoils of war. And in the spoils of war is the Stone of Destiny, which he's carrying all the way down to London and to Westminster. And the Stone of Destiny would sit there under the throne that would crown the kings and queens of England and subsequently the kings and queens of Great Britain. It would sit there for 700 years. And here we are, 700 years later, and I don't appear to have aged a bit. It's 1996 and the Stone of Destiny has made its way all the way up from Westminster, past the border here, England-Scotland border, and it's heading up to Edinburgh Castle, that bastion sitting atop an extinct volcano. And we're going to head up to Edinburgh Castle to see where the stone is lying at rest now. Well, it's great to see the stone having come all the way up from the borders up to Edinburgh. And we're now at Edinburgh Castle, right in the heart of the city. Edinburgh Castle is built on an extinct volcano and it's protected on three sides by sheer rock faces, about 400 feet. This is the east side. And this area, the Esplanade, is protected by the cannons that you can see above my head. The Stone of Destiny laid here for 28 years alongside the Crown Jewels, Scottish Crown Jewels, or the Honours of Scotland. And they're in Crown Square, right at the top of the castle. So I'd now like you to join me as I wind my way up to the top of the castle into Crown Square.
Right, we're at the top of the castle now in Crown Square. And behind me is the Royal Palace. And the upper floors actually house the Crown Jewels, or as we call them in Scotland, the Honours of Scotland. And lying alongside the Crown Jewels used to be the Stone of Destiny. The Stone of Destiny only left the castle twice in its 28 years. The first time was to go south to Westminster for the coronation of King Charles III, when it was placed under the throne and Charles was crowned. And the second time it left was only last month, March 2024, when it was sent to Perth to find its new and permanent home. So let's go off to Perth to see the Stone of Destiny. Well, I'm standing outside Perth Museum, the final resting place of the Stone of Destiny. Actually, the Stone of Schoon is its other name, and we are not far from Schoon. In fact, just two miles the other side of the River Tay is Schoon Palace. The building was originally Perth City Hall, a classical Edwardian building opened in 1914. It was latterly used as a music hall, but closed in 2005. Well, thankfully, this delightful location was saved from demolition and given over to a museum project. And last month, 30th of March 2024, the newly developed Perth Museum opened its doors. It's a world-class cultural and heritage attraction, putting Perth and Kinross at the centre of Scotland's history. Right, well, let's take a look inside this amazing museum. And I'm delighted to say that Mark Hall, the curator, is going to have a word with us and give us his take on this iconic piece of Scotland's history. Let's go. So we're now just coming into the Perth Museum where we'll find the Stone of Destiny. As you know, it's just been opened on the 30th of March 2024. And looking for the first time, it is absolutely splendid. And of course, the pièce de résistance is housed in this big, tall building above me. And we can't film within the... Uh, the stone room but um, we'll see a lovely picture of it which was given to us by Perth Museum later on. But just have a quick look around the gallery and there's some fascinating pieces. This for example, this is what appears to be a block of wood, is actually a longboat about 3,000 years old and this was hewn from one large tree trunk and it is glorious. Well welcome to Perth Museum right in the centre of Perth a city about 40 miles north of Edinburgh in this wonderful brand new museum. And I've got beside me uh, Mark Hall, who is the curator of Perth Museum. And I'd like to start by asking you, Paul, how did you come from uh, Leicester University all the way up to Perth? Uh, I've been on this journey north, I think, in my career. So from Leicester, I went to uh, Wakefield and, and worked uh, in a museum there for a few years. Mm -hmm. And then when this opportunity came up, uh, I knew someone who'd worked here before that and he always enthused about the collections so mm. I uh, applied for the job and was lucky enough to get it uh, and indeed it's the it's the collections that have, that, have, that have kept me here yeah I mean it's quite a dedication 20 years am I right in thinking here uh, over 20 years now yeah uh, and, it, and as I say it's it's the it's the collect collections here which yeah. which uh, go back in terms of when the collection started to the late 18th century and the foundation of the Perth yeah. Literary and Antiquarian Society. And so there's a lot of collecting that's gone on mm -hmm. and we have this magnificent collection uh, which in terms of the archaeology and the later history uh, and our world cultures material uh, it's never been displayed to this extent before. Yeah. So it's, yeah. a real, it's a real treasure house. Um, Clearly one of the treasures is the Stone of Destiny. When did you first hear that it might be coming to Perth? Around about eight, eight years ago. Uh, what difference do you think it's made to Perth Museum and Perth in general that you've got the Stone of Destiny actually in this building? Oh, I think it's, it's super important. In a way, it's, uh, uh, it, it's had, like me, a journey north. So <laughs> uh, for many centuries it's been in Westminster. Yeah. Then in '96 it came. Uh, north to Edinburgh Castle mm. and then it's now come even further north to Perth which is, which is a kind of twin with uh, Schoon if you look yeah. at the medieval history the, those two places worked very much together yeah so it, to come to Perth is for very much as if the stone uh, is coming home and yes. it makes it much more accessible to 
uh, everyone in Scotland, everyone anywhere, to be honest, yes. uh, it's much more accessible uh, uh, and uh, and it's a free admission. So mm -hmm. you can come as many times as you like <laughs> and get to know the stone. It's amazing that you've been so involved uh, archaeologically and of course stones like this are just over a thousand years right, old. Okay. Uh, the Stone of Destiny uh, is probably uh, no older than the 13th century, mm -hmm. so a little under a thousand years. Yeah. But there are so many kind of myths and stories about the stone, yeah. of course, that you can, there are different things that you can pick from. So yes. uh, in, in terms of the myths, some of the stories take the stone back to ancient Egypt, others take mm -hmm. it back to uh, the ancient uh, biblical land of Palestine mm -hmm. uh, and Jacob's pillow. So. You, you know, it, how long is a piece of string is really what <laughs> you're talk left about. wondering. Yeah, yeah. Well, talking about a piece of string, what's the future for this wonderful museum? Well, uh, we hope it, it will continue as it's been in its opening month to be visited by, by large numbers of people. It, we've had a terrific response from mm -hmm. the public mm -hmm. who've, who've, who've been keen to see the stone, but, but everything else as well. And yep. everything's, you know, everything, ev everything's had a great response. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, we're, we're hoping that that continues for, for many years. Yes. I can tell from your enthusiasm, you belong here. Another 20 years, perhaps? Oh, yeah. Maybe I'll be an exhibit by then in one of the cases. <laughs> Well, Mark, thank you so much. And no thank you problem. very much indeed to thank you and you your team much. as well for looking after us and for allowing us into this wonderful place today. A thank pleasure. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.